when Scrooge awoke. It was so dark that looking out of bed, he could scarcely distinguish the transparent window and the opaque walls of his chamber. He was endeavoring to pierce the darkness with his ferret eyes when the chimes of a neighboring church struck the four quarters. So he listened for the hour. To his great astonishment, the heavy bell went on from six to seven, from seven to eight, and regularly up to twelve, then stopped. Twelve! It was past two when he went to bed. The clock was wrong. Icicle must have gotten into the works. Twelve! He touched the spring of his repeater to correct this most preposterous clock. His rapid little pulse beat twelve. It stopped. Why, it is impossible, said Scrooge, that I can have slept through a whole day and far into another night. It is impossible anything has happened to the sun. This is twelve at noon. The idea being an alarming one, he scrambled out of bed and groped his way to the window. He was obliged to rub the frost off with the sleeve of his dressing gown before he could see anything. He could see very little then. All he could make out was that it was still very foggy and extremely cold. There was no noise of people running to and fro and making a great stir, as there unquestionably would have been if night had beaten off bright day and taken possession of the world. This was a great relief, because three days after sight of this first of exchange, to pay to Mr. Scrooge or his order, and so forth, would have become a mere United States security if there were no days to count by. Scrooge went to bed again and thought and thought and thought it over and over and over. He could make nothing of it. The more he thought, the more perplexed he was. The more he endeavored not to think, the more he thought. Marley's ghost bothered him exceedingly every time he resolved within himself, after mature inquiry, that it was all a dream. His mind flew back again like a strong spring release to its first position and presented the same problem to be worked all through. Was it a dream or not? Scrooge lay in the state until the chime had gone three quarters more, and then he remembered, on a sudden, that the ghost had warned him of visitation when the bell tolled one. He resolved to lie awake until the hour was past, and, considering that he could no more go to sleep than go to heaven, this was perhaps the wisest resolution in his power. The quarter was so long that he was more than once convinced he must have sunken into a doze unconsciously and missed the clock. At length it broke upon his listening ear. Ding dong. Quarter past, said Scrooge, counting. Ding dong. Half past, said Scrooge. Ding dong. Quarter to it, said Scrooge. Ding dong. The hour itself, said Scrooge triumphantly, and nothing else. He spoke before the hour bell sounded, which it now did with a deep, dull, hollow, melancholy one. Light flashed up in the room upon the instant, and the curtains of his bed were drawn. The curtains of his bed were drawn aside, I tell you, by a hand. Not at the curtains at his feet, nor the curtains at his back, but those to which his face was addressed. The curtains of his bed were drawn aside, and Scrooge, staring up into a half-recumbent attitude, found himself face to face with the unearthly visitor who drew them. As close to it as I am now to you, and I am standing in the spirit at your elbow. It was a strange figure, like a child, yet not so like a child as like an old man, viewed through some supernatural medium which gave him the appearance of having receded from the view and being diminished to a child's proportions. Its hair, which hung about its neck and down its back, was white as if with age, yet the face had not a wrinkle in it, and the tenderest bloom was on the skin. The arms are very long and muscular, the hands the same, as if its hold were of uncommon strength. His legs and feet, most delicately formed, were, like those upper members, bare. He wore a tunic of the purest white, and round its waist was bound a lustrous belt, the sheen of which was beautiful. He held a branch of fresh green holly in its hand, and, in singular contradiction of that wintry album, had its dress trimmed with summer flowers. The strangest thing about it was that, from the crown of its head, there sprung a great, clear jet of light, for which all of this was visible and which was doubtless the occasion of its using, in its duller moments, a great extinguisher for a cap, which it now held under its arm. Even this, though, when Scrooge looked at it with increasing steadiness, was not its strangest quality. For at its belt sparkled and glittered now in one part and now in another, 
and what was light one instant and the time was dark, so the figure itself fluctuated in its distinctness. Being now a thing with one arm, now with one leg, now with twenty legs, now with a pair of legs without a head, now a head without a body, of which dissolving parts no outline would be visible in the dense gloom wherein they melted away. In the very wonder of this, it would be itself again, distinct and clear as ever. "'Are you the spirit, sir, whose coming was foretold to me?' asked Scrooge. "'I am.' The voice was soft and gentle, singularly low, as if instead of being so close to him, it were at a distance. "'Who and what are you?' Scrooge demanded. "'I am the ghost of Christmas past.' "'Long past?' inquired Scrooge, observant of its dwarfish nature. "'No, your past.' Perhaps Scrooge could not have told anybody why, if anybody could have asked him, but he had a special desire to see the spirit in his cap, and begged him to be covered. "'What?' exclaimed the ghost. "'Would you so soon put out with worldly hands their light I give? It is not enough that you are one of those whose passions made this cap, and forced me through whole trains of years to wear it low upon my brow.' Scrooge reverently disclaimed all intention to offend or— any knowledge of having willfully bonneted the spirit at any period of his life. Then he bolt to inquire what business brought him there. "'Your welfare,' said the ghost. Scrooge expressed himself much obliged, but could not help thinking that a night of unbroken rest would have been more conducive to that end. The spirit must have heard him thinking, for it said immediately, "'Your reclamation, then, take heed,' and put out its strong hand as it spoke, and clasped him gently by the arm. "'Rise, and walk with me.' It would have been in vain for Scrooge to plead that the weather and the hour were not adapted to pedestrian purposes, that bed was warm and thermometer a long way below freezing, and that he was clad but lightly in his slippers, dressing gown, and nightcap, and yet a cold upon him at the time. The grasp, though gentle as a woman's hand, was not to be resisted. He rose, but finding the spirit made to all the window, clasped his rose in supplication. "'I am immortal,' Scrooge remonstrated, "'and liable to fall.' "'Bear but a touch of my hand there,' said the spirit, laying it upon his heart. "'And you shall be upheld in more than this.' As the words were spoken, they passed through the wall and stood upon an open country road, with fields on either hand. The city had entirely vanished. Not a vestige of it was to be seen. The darkness and the mist had vanished with it, for it was a clear, cold winter day, with snow upon the ground. "'Good heaven!' said Scrooge. "'clasping his hands together as he looked about him. "'I was bred in this place. I was a boy here.' "'The spirit gazed upon him mildly, "'and his gentle touch, though it had been light and instantaneous, "'appeared still present to the old man's sense of feeling. "'He was conscious of a thousand odors floating in the air, "'each one connected with a thousand thoughts and hopes and joys "'and cares long, long forgotten. "'Your lip is trembling,' said the ghost. "'What is that upon your cheek?' Scrooge muttered with an unusual catching in his voice that it was a pimple, and begged the ghost to lead him where he would. "'You recollect the way?' inquired the spirit. "'Remember it!' cried Scrooge with fervor. "'I could walk it blindfold!' "'Strange to have forgotten it for so many years,' observed the ghost. "'Let us go on.' They walked along the road, Scrooge recognizing every gate and post and tree, a little market town appeared in the distance, with its bridge, its church, and winding river. Some shaggy ponies now were seen trotting towards them with boys upon their backs, who called to other boys in country gigs and carts driven by farmers. All these boys were in great spirits and shouted to each other until the broad fields were so full of merry music that Chris Bear laughed to hear it. "'They are but shadows of the things that have been,' said the ghost. "'They have no consciousness of us.' The jocund travellers came on, and as they came, Scrooge knew and named them every one. Why was he rejoiced beyond all bounds to see them? Why did his cold eye glisten and his heart leap up as they went past? Why was he filled with gladness when he heard them give each other Merry Christmas as they parted across roads and byways for their several homes? What was Merry Christmas to Scrooge? Out upon Merry Christmas, what good had it ever done to him? The Scrooge is not quite deserted, said the ghost. The solitary child, neglected by his friends, is left there still. Scrooge said he knew it, and he sobbed. 
They left the high road by a well-remembered lane and soon approached a mansion of dull red brick with a little weathercock surmounted cupola on the roof and a bell hanging in it. It was a large house, but one of broken fortunes. The spacious offices were little used, the walls were damp and mossy, the windows were broken, the gates decayed. Fowls clucked and strutted in the stables, and now the coach houses and sheds were overrun with grass. Nor was it more retentive of its ancient state within, for entering the dreary hall and glancing through the open doors of many rooms, they found them poorly furnished, cold and vast. There was an earthly savour in the air, a chilly bareness in the place, which associated itself somehow with too much getting up by candlelight, and not too much to eat. They went, the ghost and Scrooge, across the hall to a door at the back of the house. It opened before them and disclosed a long, bare, melancholy room, made bare still by lines of plain deal forms and desks. And one of these, a lonely boy, was reading near a feeble fire, and Scrooge sat down upon a form, and wept to see his poor forgotten self as he used to be. Not a latent echo in the house, not a squeak and scuffle from the mice behind the panelling, not a drip from the half-thawed water spout in the dull yard behind. Not a sigh among the leafless boughs of one despondent poplar, not the idle swinging of an empty storehouse door, no, not a clicking of the fire, but fell upon the heart of Scrooge with a softening influence, and gave a freer passage to his tears. A spirit touched him on the arm and pointed to his younger self intent upon his reading. Suddenly a man in foreign garments, wonderfully real and distinct to look at, stood outside the window with an axe stuck in his belt and leading by the bridle an ass laden with hood. "'Why, it's Ali Baba!' Scrooge exclaimed in ecstasy. "'It's dear old honest Ali Baba! Yes, yes, I know! One Christmas time, when yonder solitary child was left here all alone, he did come for the first time, just like that.' "'Poor boy! And Valentine,' said Scrooge, "'and his wild brother Orson. There they go! Um, what's his name, who was put down in his drawers asleep at the gate of Damascus? Don't you see him?' "'and the sultan's groom turned upside down by the genie. "'There he is upon his head. "'Serve him right. I'm glad of it. "'What business had he to be married to the princess?' "'To hear Scrooge expending all the earnestness of his nature on such subjects, "'a most extraordinary voice between laughing and crying, "'to see his heightened, excited face "'would have been a surprise to his business friends in the city, indeed. "'There's the parrot!' cried Scrooge. "'Green body and yellow tail, "'with a thing like letters growing out of the top of his head.' "'There he is, poor Robin Crusoe,' he called him, when he came home again after sailing round the island. "'Poor Robin Crusoe, where have you been, Robin Crusoe?' The man thought he was dreaming, but he wasn't. He was a parrot, you know. "'There goes Friday, running for his life to Little Creek. "'Halloa! Hoop! Halloo!' Then, with the rapidity of transition very far to his usual character, he said, in pity for his former self, "'Poor boy!' and cried again. I wish, Scrooge muttered, putting his hand in his pocket, looking about him, after drying his eyes with his cuff. But it's too late now. What is the matter? asked the spirit. Nothing, said Scrooge. Nothing. There was a boy singing a Christmas carol at my door last night. I should like to have given him something, that's all. The ghost smiled thoughtfully and waved its hand, saying as it did so. Let us see another Christmas. Scrooge's former self grew larger at the words, and the room became a little darker and more dirty. The panels shrunk, the windows cracked, fragments of plaster fell out of the ceiling, and the naked laths were shown instead. How all this was brought about, Scrooge knew no more than you do. He only knew that it was quite correct, that everything had happened so, that there he was, alone again, and all the other boys had gone home for the jolly holidays. He was not reading now, but walking up and down despairingly. Scrooge looked at the ghost, and, with a mournful shaking of his hand, glanced anxiously towards the door. It opened, and a little girl, much younger than the boy, came darting in and putting her arms around his neck and often kissing him, addressing him as her dear, dear brother. "'I've come to bring you home, dear brother,' said the child, clasping her tiny hands and bending down to laugh. <laughs> "'To bring you home, home, home!' "'Home, little fan,' replied the boy. Yes, said the girl, brimful of glee. Home for good and all. Home for ever and ever. 
Father's so much kinder than he used to be, that home's like heaven. He spoke so gently to me one dear night when I was going to bed, that I was not afraid to ask him once more if you might come home, and he said yes, you should, and sent me in a coach to bring you. And you ought to be a man, said the child, opening her eyes, and I'll never to come back here, but first we're to be together all the Christmas long and have the merriest time in all the world. You're quite a woman, little fan, exclaimed the boy. She clapped her hands and laughed and tried to touch his head, but being too little, laughed again and stood on tiptoe to embrace him. And she began to drag him in her childish eagerness towards the door. He, nothing loth to go, accompanied her. A terrible voice in the hall cried, "'Bring down Master Scrooge's box, there!' And in the hall appeared the schoolmaster himself, who glared on Master Scrooge with a ferocious condescension and threw him into a dreadful state of mind by shaking hands with him. He then conveyed him and his sister into the veriest old well of a shivering best ball that, rare, that ever was seen, where the maps upon the wall and the celestial and terrestrial globes in the windows were waxy with cold. Here he produced a decanter of curiously light wine and the block of curiously heavy cake, and administered installments of those dainties to the young people. At the same time, sending out a meager servant to offer a glass of something to the postboy, who answered that he thanked the gentleman, but if it was the same tap he had tasted before, he had rather not. Master Scrooge's trunk being by this time tied on top of the chaise, the children bade the schoolmaster good-bye right willingly, and getting into it drove gaily down the garden sweep the quick wheels dashing the hoar frost and snow from off the dark leaves of the evergreens like spray. Always a delicate creature whom a breath might have withered, said the ghost, but she had a large heart. So she had, cried Scrooge. You're right. I will not gainsay it, spirit, God forbid. She died a woman, said the ghost, and had, as I think, children. One child, Scrooge returned. True, said the ghost, your nephew. Scrooge seemed uneasy in his mind and answered briefly, Yes. Although they had but that moment left the school behind them, they were now in the busy thoroughfares of a city, where shadowy passengers passed and repassed, where shadowy carts and coaches battled for the way, and all the strife and tumult of real city were. It was made plain enough by the dressing of the shops that here, too, it was Christmas time again, but it was evening and the streets were lighted up. The ghost stopped at a certain warehouse door and asked Scrooge if he knew it. "'Know it?' said Scrooge. "'Was I apprenticed here?' They went in, the sight of an old gentleman in a Welsh wig, sitting behind such a high desk that if he had been two inches taller he might have knocked his head against the ceiling. Scrooge cried in great excitement. "'Why, it's old Fezziwig! Bless his heart, it's Fezziwig alive again!' Old Fezziwig laid down his pen and looked up at the clock, which pointed to the hour of seven. He rubbed his hands, adjusted his capacious waistcoat, laughed all over himself from his shoes to his organ of benevolence, and called out in a comfortable, oily, rich, fat, jovial voice, Yo-ho there! Ebenezer! Dick! Scrooge's former self, now grown a young man, came briskly in, accompanied by his fellow apprentice. Dick Wilkins, to be sure, said Scrooge to the ghost. Bless me, yes, there he is. He was very much attached to me, was Dick. Poor Dick. Dear, dear. Yo ho, my boys, said Fezziwig. No more work tonight. Christmas Eve, Dick. Christmas, Ebenezer. Let's have the shutters up, cried old Fezziwig with a sharp clap of his hand, before a man can say Jack Robinson. You wouldn't believe how those two fellows went at it. They charged into the street with the shutters. One, two, three, had him up in their places. Four, five, six, barred him and pinned him. Seven, eight, nine, and came back before you have got to twelve, panting like racehorses. Hey ho! cried old Fezziwig, skipping down from the high desk with wonderful agility. Clear away, my lads, and let's have lots of room here. Hilly ho, Dick! Cheer up, Ebenezer! Clear away. There was nothing that wouldn't have cleared away or couldn't have cleared away with old Fezziwig looking on. It was done in a minute. Every movable was packed off, as if it were dismissed from public life forevermore. The floor was swept and watered, the lamps were trimmed, fuel was heaped upon the fire, and the warehouse was as snug and warm and dry and bright a ballroom as you would desire to see upon a winter's night. In came a fiddler with a music book and went up to the lofty desk and made an orchestra of it, tuned like fifty stomach aches. In came Mrs. Fezziwig, one vast, substantial smile. In came the three Miss Fezziwigs, beaming and lovable. In came the six young followers, whose hearts they broke. 
In came all the young men and women employed in the business. In came the housemaid with her cousin, the baker. In came the cook with her brother's particular friend, the milkman. In came the boy from over the way, who was suspected of not having bored enough from his master, trying to hide himself behind the girl from next door but one, who was proved to have had her ears pulled by a mistress. In they all came, one after another, some shyly, some boldly, some gracefully, some awkwardly, some pushing, some pulling. In they all came, anyhow and everyhow. Away they all went, twenty couple at once, hands half round and back again the other way, down the middle and up again, round and round, various states of affectionate grooving. Old top couple always turning up in the wrong place, new top couple starting off again as soon as they got there, old top couples at last, and not a bottom one to help them. This result was brought about, old Fezziwig clapping his hands to stop the dance, cried, Well done! And the fiddler plunged his hot face into a pot of porter, specially provided for that purpose. With scorning rest upon his reappearance, he instantly began again, though there were no dances yet, as if the other fiddler had been carried home exhausted on a shutter, he were a brand new man resolved to beat him out of sight or perish. There were more dances, and there were forfeits, and more dances, and there was cake, there was niggas, and there was a great piece of cold roast, and there was a great piece of cold boiled, and there were mince pies and plenty of beer. The great effect of the evening came after the roast and boiled, when the fiddler, an artful dog mind, the sort of man who knew his business better than you or I could have doled at him, struck up Sir Roger de Coverley. Then old Fezziwig stood out to dance with Mrs. Fezziwig. Top couple, too, the good stiff piece of work cut out for them. Three or four and twenty pair of partners, people who were not to be trifled with, people who would dance and had no notion of walking.